Well, okay, so what happens with Zachary Taylor as president? Taylor turned out to be much more pro-Northern than anyone expected. First of all, he, as I said, he was a sugar planter. What difference does that make? Sugar planters had a different set of economic interests than cotton planters or tobacco or rice. Sugar planters relied on a high national federal tariff. They were co cotton, cotton didn't need it to carry, cotton controlled the world cotton supply. They didn't care. The sugar planters, who are a small group in southern Louisiana, are competing with sugar from Cuba, from other parts of the Caribbean, cheap, which is cheaper. They're still using slave labor down there in Cuba. And, and, they're, and they're, it's cheaper, it seems. Maybe the climate is better or something. Than, so, so in other words, they, they are frightened of competition from imported sugar, which the cotton planters have no fear like that. So they actually are in favor of a strong national government that can protect them and a high tariff and all the other Southerners want to load. So Taylor is much more of a nationalist in that sense than many um, uh, other slave owners. Uh, he's also a general. You know, he's a military guy. He identifies with Andrew Jackson, uh, a general as president. And these guys were pretty tough-minded. And when some Southerners, when 1849 rolls around, start talking about secession, or nullification if they, if, if they pass a law barring slavery in the territory. Uh, Taylor says, forget that. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm going to do what General Jackson did. Jackson said, I'm going to send troops in the nullification crisis into South Carolina. He's a slave owner, but he doesn't let South Carolina nullify federal law. So Taylor is not sympathetic to the radical Southerners who are becoming more vocal uh, at this time. In fact, he comes to rely for political advice on Senator William Seward, of New York, a Whig like him, but a strong anti-slavery person. Taylor's all sorts of political issues are coming to, be, coming to a head in relating to slavery in 1849 and 1850. This will lead, of course, to the, what we call the Compromise of 1850. But Taylor says, we're not going to deal with all that stuff. There's only one issue we've got to deal with right now, admitting California. Remember they had this nice gold rush in California? Everyone's heard about the California gold rush, 1848, 49. Thousands and thousands of, California was quite unpopulated when the United States um, acquired it, except for Native Americans. There were a lot of them out there. But um, here's, um, yeah, here's, anyone here from Los Angeles? Let's get our lights down a little. This is Los Angeles, like in 1848. I mean, there's nobody there, there's nothing. I don't know what it is now, but it's nothing back then. <laughs> anyway, um, but as soon as the gold is discovered in Northern California, thousands, tens of thousands of people pour in from all over the world, not just from the East, from Australia, from China, from Europe. And suddenly there's enough population to become a state and California elects, without any authorization from Congress at all, elects a convention drafts a state constitution barring slavery from California and asks for admissions, admission to the Union as a state. And Taylor says, yeah, cool, let them in. There's a, they, they got the population. That's the solution to the problem, just admit California. But many Southerners don't want California because it will begin tipping the balance away from, you know, oh, right now there's equality, so to speak, between slave and free states. But you admit one free state, there can be more. They don't want to tip that balance. Here are other issues that were thrown up in Congress at this point. Um, what's going to be the status of slavery in those other territories acquired from Mexico, which we mentioned? Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, Colorado whatever it is. Um, what's going to be the status there? Southerners are demanding a new fugitive slave law. In 1842, in its first case dealing with the Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution, a case known as Prigg versus Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court had issued one of it, you know, the Supreme Court is, it's amazing we respect them so much because so many of their decisions are completely irrational and impossible to understand. And this was a good one because on the one hand it says, hey, 
the Constitution says they got to have their slaves, their fugitive slaves back, so what's the problem here? They got to have them back. And in fact, they said any slave owner can just go into a northern state and grab a fugitive and bring them back. You don't need the government to do that. You don't need that. You just go and grab them. It's like if it's your property. If your horse ran away, you can go and get that horse and bring him home without having to go to court and all that kind of stuff. You can even go on someone else's property if your horse happens to be there, as long as you don't, you know, get into an assault on the owner or something. That's what's known as the common law of recaption. Anyone here going to law school? The common law of recaption. You can just go and get your property if somehow it got out of, you know, got out of your grip. But let's say you can't just go and grab them. You know, it's not that easy. What if, what if you want the government to help you out? Well, the decision said, well, no, you know, actually, it's not the role of the states. It's the federal government. This is a responsibility of the federal government. The states don't have to do anything. It's a federal responsibility to go and get those fugitive slaves. So when they were told that, northern states began passing what they call personal liberty laws, saying, okay, we're not going to help. We got a no judge, no sheriff, no law enforcement agent can assist in, rend in the rendition, as they call it, of a fugitive slave. That's what the Supreme Court said. We don't have to do it, so why should we do it? Let the Southerners worry about this. So Southerners are demanding now a new draconian fugitive slave law to get the federal government to go and do this and also to override northern laws interfering with the capture of fugitive slaves.